porn is really just a way we disassociate from our current reality. And my current reality is I don't like myself right now. I don't want to feel that right now. And you can disassociate with things other than porn too. Hey man, in today's episode on neglect with Stephen Thomas, you will get answers to questions like, was I neglected? Why is that an important question? And you will learn the six different types of neglect and what we can do in order to recognize this and heal from it. You will get some really practical examples of self-compassion, of how to speak away shame, to speak hope into your life. And I'm really excited. Steven is a very close friend of mine. And I think you guys will really enjoy listening to his story at the beginning. It's really powerful. And then for the rest of the episode, gaining tons of wisdom. Here we go. Today, I am welcoming Steven Thomas back to the show. The man who has been on this podcast more than anyone else except me, he's my friend, he is a coach, a certified husband material coach, and taking some really exciting new steps in his business. Welcome back, Stephen. Thank you for having me, Drew. Um, it's always fun to be on, and I always love getting to talk to you, so I'm excited for this conversation we're about to have. Yeah, this is a chance for us to hang out and talk about such an important topic that is sometimes neglected, which is neglect. I see what you did there. <laughs> yeah. But before we do, I would like to give everyone a refresher on who you are because we've done all these episodes and maybe somebody is not as familiar with you and your story. So what do people need to know about Stephen Thomas? Well, the first thing to know is um, that I saw porn at a really early age. I saw it at age seven. Um, but I was, I believe I was actually groomed for it in that, um, when it was offered to me, I said, yes. And the reason I was groomed for it was because, um, I was left alone at home a lot to watch TV on my own and just being exposed to all the, you know, sexual messages that come through TV and not being parented, not being watched as I did that. I was very sexual as a kid. So, uh, when it was offered to me, I was ready to say yes. And um, I grew up in the 90s. Um, we had this, the way cable worked back then is uh, the porn channels would be kind of blurred out, but you could still see stuff. So I watched a lot of porn through the blurry lines. Um, and I got smart and knew how to manipulate it and make it less blurry. But I watched tons and tons of porn in my own home. Um, and, you know, I carried lots of shame. I was, a, we, I grew up in a Christian family. Um, we love the Lord. Uh, but you know, my mom, my parents had some financial issues. My mom had to go back to work and that's why I was able to be home alone. I was the youngest of four and uh, therefore, you know, I have sisters that are like 10 years older than me. So they were my babysitters and were, you know, were good. They were nice to me and things like that, but they were also more interested in playing with their friends than actually watching me. So I had lots of free time to myself. Um, but through just the shame of watching porn, I became very insecure. Um, I also was really insecure just from being the youngest growing up in a family. Like we were pretty active and uh, into sports and things like that. And uh, we would go out and play. And because I was the littlest, I couldn't keep up. And so it wasn't a fun experience for me. There was, again, like, you know, no parent around to help, you know, make a, a, good, a, uh, a good and enjoyable experience for everybody involved, including myself. So that also caused me to retreat and disappear and just sort of medicate um, it, or find a place to feel good, which was TV. I loved watching TV. Um, and then uh, the next piece of my story is that in junior high, I had a friend that had this device that made every channel clear or legally. And it's really funny because I went to a Christian school, but it seemed like everybody had <laughs> this, it was called a black box and it would um, unscramble the channels. And we would go to his house after school and watch porn for hours and hours and hours. And it was during that season that um, there was a point where I developed same-sex attraction. I noticed that I was more attracted to the guy in uh, the situation than I was the female. Um, and it actually all started with curiosity. I was really interested in seeing what intercourse looked like. The porn we were watching didn't actually show it like up close, but I was like, what does it look like when a penis inserts into a vagina? And that's actually where that um, focus came from but I got confused and you know I'd already believed I was a pervert going into it and I remember when I realized my attention was on the guy I was like oh no I made myself gay but 
that turned into the primary focus of all porn I was watching became um, homosexual and from that point forward for the next 12 years. And um, like I said, I did grow up in a Christian family. And truthfully, the, the way I got out was um, in the process of relapses and, and all these breakdowns in my life, um, I, would, I would repent. It's like I would go to God and say, God, I don't want to do this. And I'd feel his goodness and I'd feel restored. And it was like, he'd really meet me and I could feel his love and I'd feel renewed. And then maybe I would like try again. And that would last for like a day or two, you know, but I kept trying. And I think that he heard my prayers. Um, and in a really supernatural way, he started giving people in my family dreams about me. Like there was one point where my parents had a dream about me in the same night and confronted me about the issue. And um, God sort of cornered me. He's like, hey, you've been asking for some help here it is <laughs> um it was kind of scary uh, but um i couldn't hide anymore really and i got into some counseling got some help and um and then even along the way my brother had a dream about me and again and i he actually became my accountability partner i i decided to stop hiding and uh just confess the things i was watching uh you know, for me, not hiding for myself was recognizing I did not have the capability to say no to porn. So I needed um, like blocking software. I was not going to be able to make that decision on my own. So that was me being honest with myself. So not hiding from myself. And um, in that process um, of, or in that season, I started noticing relapses, the time between relapses increasing. And it's important to know that my relapses at this point wasn't just porn. I was meeting up for sex with men that I was meeting online. So that was kind of like the first thing I was trying to end because that's, you know, pretty dangerous, unhealthy activity, right? And um, yeah, my, uh, I started to see the increase in time between relapses. And also in that season, I met a woman um, and she was a girl that I really, really liked and was experiencing a lot of attraction for. And for me, that felt like such a cool or it was such an exciting experience, not just cool. Cool is the most under uh, way to understate that. Uh, it was it was an incredibly exciting experience for me because I had always dreamed of being a husband and a father, and I felt like I potentially ruined that for myself because I wasn't experiencing attraction towards women. And um, here I was attracted to this woman, and we became friends. And I quickly knew she was somebody special, so we dated, and like right away, we both knew, okay, this is the one for me. So I told her about like my struggle where I was because I, I didn't want to like blindside her, have her go down this journey of a very serious relationship and then be like, oh, on our wedding, like, guess what? <laughs> you know, um, so I, I opened up to her and, um, and then like six weeks into dating her, I did use porn one time and um, I confessed it to her and, you know, she cried and I, you know, sat with her in her pain and she let me know how it impacted her. And, um, and I said words I couldn't believe were coming out of my mouth, which was, I'll never do it again. But I have not done it again since that time. Uh, yes, praise the Lord. Uh, that was over 13 years ago that that happened because we're about to have our 13 year anniversary and we dated for a year before we got married. And um, I'll say this too, like, she plays a big role because she was honest with me about like where her grace was at. She's like, I don't, I know I won't be able to exist. Like if you're relapsing with porn, with gay porn, like I just don't have grace for it. And it wasn't her being mean or like holding something over. It was her being honest with herself about what she was capable of. So I had a real fear of the Lord that I would lose her if I continued forward. And that helped me stay in the light and not hide. And that was, you know, staying in the light and not hiding. Might be, some people might count it, uh, uh, call that accountability. But the truth is, is that was vulnerability for me um, because it's consistent staying in the light, it's staying open. Um, and I had to learn that over time. So, so yeah, I've been free from porn for over 13 years, um, but it, it's greater than the 12 years of experiencing same-sex attraction, of losing the battle to same-sex attraction. Uh, that, so that's important. And I'm really grateful for that. Um, and I was going to say too, um, that, yeah, and I'm, post 14 years now with regards to, you know, actual uh, meeting up for sexual encounters with anybody other than my wife. So praise God for that too. So the numbers keep climbing. I feel like I keep healing. It's not, I'm not white knuckling it. I truly am experiencing more freedom and healing along the way. Um, 
there are things I was attracted to that I'm not. Um, I definitely, I'm super attracted to my wife. Uh, we are thriving relationally and in, uh, intimately. Uh, we really love our marriage. So um, yeah, I say that to offer hope that I know what it's like to be stuck and you can get unstuck. Amen. And you are helping people do that now through Stephen Thomas Consulting. That's right. I'm coaching individuals. I partner with you in doing uh, small groups. And then I also coach couples. Stephen is awesome. I highly recommend him. And I can't think of a better person to talk about today's topic and answering this question, was I neglected? I mean, clearly neglect is a big part of your story. And yet we can't usually see it in our own story. Maybe it's easy to spot in someone else's story, but in our own story, it's almost like this invisible air that we breathe. Um, So today we're going to help everybody get an answer to this. Was I neglected? Stephen, why is this question so important? Yeah, Um, like you said, it's hard to identify. Um, The truth is, is I did not get like neglected in a way that, you know, it's not like I was locked in under a staircase like Harry Potter. Um, You know, it's not like these severe neglect things that we picture when we talk about neglect. Um, It's the type of neglect I experience, I think is almost commonplace. People would be like, oh, that's no big deal. But when I've dug into my pain and I dug and I dig into how that pain has affected me today, I realized, oh, I'm carrying trauma from um, not getting what I needed. And maybe you could frame neglect as that. There's needs we have in life and we don't get them. So we're, you know, we're neglected in receiving things we need. So um, there's something called big T trauma and little T trauma. And big T trauma is like the obvious stuff. Again, like you're getting beat up or maybe you were abused physically or sexually. And it's kind of, it's more easy to identify, but little T trauma is harder because it's like this. It's normally just like blind spots. For example, if you weren't um, engaged with emotionally in your family, you may just have grown up thinking, well, it's normal to just sort of bury things under the rug, like, oh, don't make a big fuss about things. And that's just normal for you. But it's actually against how God designed us. You know, we're not supposed to live hidden. We're not supposed to live emotionally disconnected from one another. And therefore, we've actually experienced emotional neglect. So it's hard to even know it's a blind spot because you grew up thinking, oh, that, that's normal. Yeah, I totally relate to that. And I think I was not neglected or abandoned in any way. And at the same time, I do, I have met some guys who struggle to understand like, where's the trauma in my story? And maybe it's hard to call this trauma. But the thing with big T and little t trauma, so if being emotionally neglected in the way I just described is a form of little t trauma, the reason why you can call it trauma is it actually has the same psychological impact as a big T trauma if it goes unprocessed. So what you're saying is, there are lots of little T's over time that can add up to a huge impact. Yeah, exactly. And in truthfully, all pain, (laughs) this this is a good point to take away. You don't have to compare your pain to other people and dismiss it. It's if you process it or not. Um, You know, we're, we're meant to be able to articulate when we're in pain and not carry it all by ourselves and connect and experience love in those places. And that statement, what I just said, I'm curious if it's making people cringe a bit. Like, really? Are you sure? (laughs) And I like to tell guys I work with, listen, like you got to realize that the operating system you've lived with your whole life got you to where you are. So when you're trying to download a new operating system to change your life, uh, which biblically is renewing the mind. That's what we're talking about the old operating system at times is gonna be like, no, 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 no. It's going to push back. And it takes a lot of time to truly renew the mind. And it's an, it's actually a lifetime process. You'll find new places in your mind that need to get renewed. I appreciate you saying that and just validating the resistance that we may feel to accepting that we didn't get what we need in certain ways. And also you made that point, which was so powerful to me that the pain that really impacts us is what didn't get processed, no matter how big, no matter how small, if it never got resolved, if it became a place where we never received love, 
then it still needs healing. Yes. Yes. God is infinitely wise and incredible in how he designed us. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And um, I just learned uh, about myself and about others that we really are capable of a lot. So truly, even if you've ha had major difficult experiences, like you can process it and heal. Everything is redeemable. We have a redeeming, loving God, and he wants he wants you to be able to, like you just said, experience love in that place of pain. Um, mm -hmm. So what's hard, though, is we have this culture where it's like, oh, you shouldn't, it's it's like there's something wrong with you if you're experiencing pain in certain areas. You know, we, we believe that there's something wrong with us. And that that's the other reason why this topic is so important, which is, like, think about it like this. If your parents didn't talk to you about sex, the message that gets communicated to you through no communication at all is that sex is something you're going to be able to figure out on your own. So here I am at age seven using porn, and I know it's bad, and I'm supposed to be able to figure this out on my own, that nobody's really started talking to me about this, and that turns into shame, like, oh, I guess something's wrong with me. If I'm supposed to be able to figure this out on my own, and I'm failing, well, then the only logical conclusion for a kid is to blame themselves. So we get trapped in shame. We get trapped, like, I, I see this happen all the time with guys, just having emotional needs, people getting trapped because they have no clue that they can actually express them, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and reach out and say, I have this need in our friendship, in our relationship, in our marriage. I have this need in my marriage, things like that. Um, we, we actually will beat ourselves up over having the need because we're not, we're supposed to be okay. We're supposed to just be able to figure it out on our own. Man, that is so, so real. I was just in a group this week where one of the members overcame his shame and his self-blame to say, hey guys, I reached out with a really vulnerable text message and nobody responded. And that really hurt. And I was so proud of him. I was championing him. I was saying, thank you so much. Changing the narrative and renewing all of our minds by saying, yes, it is okay to have needs and healing from some of the neglect because when you send that kind of message and there's no response, it is such a trigger for neglect, making us feel like we're all alone again, like something's wrong with us, that nobody is there to help. I, I can totally relate. You send that text, you don't get a response, and it's like, am I too needy? What's wrong with me? You know, like here I am. It, it takes me back to part of my story. You know, I said um, I started struggling with same sex attraction in junior high, and um, I acted out at that time with a kid who had actually bullied me. And I remember when I changed schools in third grade, he was, you know, a big part of the pain I experienced. And, um, and I remember following him around at soccer practice because I was excited just to make a new friend. And he's like, why are you following me? And in that moment, I was like, oh, did I do something wrong? Like, it's wrong to have friends. So it takes me back to that pain, to that wound where, you know, somebody spoke over me like I was behaving in a weird way. And maybe you got a direct message like that, or you've heard other people talk about others being too needy because they actually just don't have the emotional capacity to sit with people in their pain. Um, and to be fair, there's a time we can be needy. I get that. I think we're exposing and talking about things that don't happen because we just act like we're okay. And we actually feel really disconnected and lonely. Exactly. And that's a huge part of what fuels attachment to porn because if I'm feeling needy and I don't believe that others can help me meet those needs, then what am I going to do? Yeah. And if I feel that I'm needy and I hate myself about this, if I actually am in self-contempt, I want to escape the pain of that even. So I'll numb out and try to, you know, porn is really just a way we disassociate from our current reality. And my current reality is I don't like myself right now. I don't want to feel that right now. And you can disassociate with things other than porn too. This makes a lot of sense. So far, what we've been talking about is emotional neglect. Steven, you talk about six different types of neglect, though, that there are many different ways that we can be impacted by not having our needs met. So what are those six types? The six that I've thought up were physical neglect, emotional neglect, spiritual neglect, sexual neglect, relational neglect, and academic neglect. Um, for anybody who's like sexual neglect, what? What I'm talking about is your parents talking to you about sex. 
and, and realizing that that's an area that we actually have to be parented in. All these types of things are things we need to be parented in or um, yeah, have experiences uh, to meet you know, physical needs, emotional needs, spiritual needs, even sexual needs, uh, learning how to navigate our sexuality in a healthy way because we are sexual beings. So those are the six I've identified. Um, and I've actually created a course around, it's just, it's like a workshop type thing that I've done several times. I love the way that you said we need to be parented in them, which might sound hopeless for somebody who thinks, oh, well, I didn't get parented in that area, so I guess I'm doomed. But the good news is that we can be reparented. Yeah, and we'll talk about that. That's a big um, way out of, that's a big tool I think that people can use to, to give themselves what they need when they realize, oh, I have a lack in this area. Um, but why don't we dive into um, what each of these topics means and how to identify them. Let's um, do it. So with physical neglect, so to me, there's kind of two sides to this. One is how we take care of our body and two is um, like just physical touch. So some great questions to ask yourself to identify if you've experienced physical neglect is, were you, parent, were you parented on how to take care of your body? Um, were you parented on how to take care of your body? Were you taught hygiene? Did your parents demonstrate taking care of their body or were they really out of shape unhealthy? Um, also on the other side, was healthy physical touch a part of my upbringing? Um, or were there negative messages sent to me about my body as a boy, as I've grown up and developed? So these are all questions you can ask yourself to identify, did you experience physical neglect in some kind of way? Um, the next one is emotional neglect, which is, uh, was I connected with emotionally or were we, we taught in my family to bury our emotions? Um, one other one I think is really important with this is did my parents play with me? Because that mm. is such a powerful way that kids connect emotionally is through play. So maybe you grew up in a family where it was just serious the whole time. Um, mm -hmm. Were you allowed to express, you know, needs or pain? Or do you struggle with this question of, am I needy? That might be signs that you were actually emotionally neglected. And I'm going to say this too, because one question I think is kind of a golden question you can ask is like, do you look up to your parents as somebody you can mimic to be healthy in any of these areas? So, um, cause if you didn't have a parent that had ownership of that for themselves, it's, it's very likely they weren't able to pass that on to you. Wow. So the next one is spiritual neglect. Um, did your parents have an active relationship with God or were you guys just, you know, Sunday Christians? Um, did they lead you and teach you and guide you into a relationship with God? Was it something, yeah, you talked about on the regular um, and sexual one? So yeah, was talking to me about sex and teaching me about healthy sexuality normal in my home? Um, here's a great one. Did either of your parents struggle with addiction? Did Was there infidelity? Um, again, they likely didn't pass it or have healthy conversations about sexuality with you if they're struggling with this. Um, even if there was sexual abuse, maybe you learn that sexual abuse was happening with one of your siblings or it happened to you. Uh, like, obviously that's a big T trauma, but there's the neglect part is that you still weren't given tools to do sexuality in a healthy way. And then uh, relational needs. So was I taught how to relate to other people? Again, look at your parents. Did your parents have quality friends, especially your dad? Um, did your family enjoy being around one another or were you guys living islands in, under the same roof? Um, mm -hmm. My family, like, yeah, <laughs> we had a hard time always being around each other in some, in some areas and in other areas, we did great, but, um, but definitely I've seen that one a lot. And then after, did your family enjoy being around each other is, did you regularly feel lonely in your own home? Man, that resonates with me. Another one for relational neglect is also in regards to dating. Also in regards to how do you relate to people that you are sexually attracted to? Uh, and just some basic tips and guidance that so many of us didn't get. Yeah, and that just points to, like I said, you could grow this list and you could throw that one under relational or sexual needs uh, that need to get parented. Um, it, the point is, is we are developing and as humans, we're complex creatures. We have, we're multifaceted, we have sexuality, we have a need for healthy relationships and connection. And actually, these are not things that people will naturally know how to do. Think about like seeing little kids play. They will steal toys from one another. You actually teach them how to relate to one another and not be bullies and not be 
you know, mean to one another. And it's really funny because, you know, I have young kids and I see other young, you know, parents with young kids and you see parents freaking out, like if their kid is kind of maybe being a little bit rude or mean. And it's like, it's just your job to parent them. Your kid is good. Just get in there and parent them, <laughs> you know? Um, we we can do a lot to help our kids learn and be like, hey, how, what was it like? Or what would it feel like to do that to somebody else? But um, that's just a real life example I see today. Uh, and it's good to know that, you know, your kids are fine. You are fine. You may just need help learning how to relate to people, which, and you can get that help. So, um, and then the last one is academic, um, which to me, I wonder if academic is even the best word for it, because it's, it's about um, productivity in life in a way. And, um, but a great question I asked myself was, was I helped with my homework? Um, did my parents make sure I was doing okay at school and getting work done? And I have a big story I'll share in a minute about this. Uh, but yeah, like if your kid has fallen behind, like sometimes you got to be the parent that says, okay, we're getting the work done. You know, your kid will, if you leave them by themselves, they will not do their work. They'll go watch TV, you know, and then they might feel a lot of shame as they are, you know, falling behind in school. But it's our job as parents to be there for our kids, or it was your parents' job to be there for you. And, but these are common ways that I think um, people experience lack, where we actually didn't get help. Again, it was just like, oh, I'm supposed to be able to figure this out my own. I'm, I know I'm supposed to be doing my homework, but I'm choosing to watch TV. And now I feel like I'm a piece of crap because, you know, I have no um, ability to get things done. I can't, you know, complete work and stuff like that. So again, notice how that can quickly turn to shame statements when we are given a void or when we have a void of parenting. So that lack, that deprivation can quickly transform into thinking there's a problem with me. Yeah, exactly. That, that's the big takeaway. If, if you're hard on yourself, you've probably actually been neglected in some ways. In one way, one form of being hard on yourself is hiding. What do you mean you're by that? Depri you're depriving yourself of connection and love because you have like perceived weakness. We're actually, you know, one way I prove health to myself is when I like realize like an area of my heart that's tender or is in need. I, I've been learning to be open because it was hard for me to have problems in front of people. Because remember, oh, I'm supposed to be able to figure it all out on my own. And I did it and I, I'm ashamed of myself. So reversing the curse is being open, which is great because we're made to want that. Yeah. So neglect teaches us to despise ourselves. Neglect teaches us that we have to do everything on our own. We can't depend on other people. Neglect teaches us to hide. What else does it teach us to do? I think it teaches us to not ask for help. It'll get us stuck. Um, again, you're because you believe you should be able to figure it out on your own. How many guys have failed at outgrowing porn because of trying to do it on their own? Me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> could have saved 12 years of my life, you know, 17 years of my life just by being open about it. And as we've also talked about, neglect teaches us to cope. It teaches us to turn to something or someone, whether it's a real person or pixels to get some semblance of our needs met. And sexuality is a really easy way to do that. Yeah, that's so good. And because if there's a theme that's sort of emerging in this conversation of isolation um, coming out of neglect stories. And um, the truth is, is we're not made to be isolated. The very first negative statement in the Bible, you know, God made the earth, made everything at the first six days and said it was good. It was good. Or sorry, the first five days, because on the sixth day he made man because he said, oh, it's not good that man be alone. Sometimes I see Christians getting stuck. It's God will meet all my needs. God will meet all my needs. It was God who said it's not good for man to be alone. So he, he said, oh, me and you is not enough. You need people too. So it's really powerful to consider that and, um, and just recognize that, yeah, isolation is going against what God, how God made us to be. And actually, when you live in isolation for an extended period of time, that in and of itself is another form of trauma. Carrying these wounds, being stuck 
of being stuck in addiction, there's trauma associated to that. Um, I, yeah, I, I've even noticed in my own heart, I've been in a season where I've been noticing anytime I feel stuck, it, it, it stirs up pain for me because I can think of all the years I felt stuck in addiction. Um, the first few years of my marriage were not good. I felt very stuck there. You know, so it's maybe some people call this PTSD. I don't know, but um, it's another form of trauma that it, it, it's a trauma that just feeds off of this hiddenness, this isolation that comes from this belief of, oh, I should be able to do this all on my own. I shouldn't need help for this. It's, there's something wrong with me that I need help for this, which I believe has a root in neglect. If you grew up in a family where you were used to your parents and walking hand in hand with someone as you grew up and the lines of communication about whatever topic being open for you, I think it, you'd have a different story than addiction. So we've talked about the problem. We've talked about the roots of why porn became a part of our lives and why we turn to unwanted sexual behavior from a story of neglect. What can we do practically as we recognize ways that we were neglected? Yeah, so I think, you know, the first thing you do have to do is acknowledge it and I identify it. So, you know, I read a bunch of questions earlier in this episode related to um, how to identify if you've experienced neglect. So as you hear those, what stirs inside of you? You know, it, it probably unsurfaced some stories as you were listening to me talk to these things. So you want to actually describe what ne the neglect was and what, yeah, what it specifically was and how it impacted you. So, I mean, I would, I would journal about it. I would write it down, right? Like this is the, the neglect I experienced. And then it's good to consider when this impacted you. Like, yeah, my whole childhood, I didn't experience this, or I really was experiencing this at this age range. And then it's also good to pause and think of like what the fruit of that neglect has been in your life. Um, consider where you're at now, considering or, or, and consider when that fruit began to appear too. So when did, you know, addiction start to appear? When did, not even just porn addiction, maybe you were a gamer, you know, maybe you had no friends, things like that. I don't know. Like, just think of like when the fruit of this appeared. Well, you're describing me in middle school. <laughs> no friends, porn, video games. That is Drew in eighth and ninth grade. <laughs> it's so funny because you're like, ooh, ooh, me. <laughs> My inner child is bubbling up saying, that was me. You see me, you know me. So for me, like, you know, I, I said, I'll talk about the academic one. So um, I was really good at schoolwork as a kid and it came easy for me. But uh, so anytime that there was like an assignment that required putting in some work in that, like, I, it wasn't just like answering questions. Like maybe it was like a project, like build a diorama or whatever. Like I would just not do it or reading a book take this book home and read it. I just wouldn't do it. And nobody was checking in to make sure I was. So, um, so what happened was in that, you know, we, I'd come to class and our teacher would write our name on the board if we weren't done. And that means we couldn't go out for recess and I, I could just feel the trauma of that. And that grew for me. And, you know, at home, I was just numbing out with TV or with porn. And when I was in college, I was an engineer and engineering's a hard degree. Um, it requires lots of work. And, um, I remember so many times just having this list of like to do and it, I just couldn't get it done. And I didn't believe in my ability to get it done because nobody had walked with me and developed that part of then like, okay, I know it's hard. No, you don't want to do it, but you're going to do it. And just even doing that, knowing like, oh, I'm connected to this person who's maybe setting a hard boundary with me here, but I still know like my parents love, me, you know, never experiencing these types of things. And also like numbing out from the pain of that to-do list with porn and with acting out. Um, that was really hard for me. And it's funny because like as I said today, I notice when I have a to-do list, I can feel that same trauma show up. I can feel like this, like, ah, I, I really, it's a really tender spot that I'm still working on. And um, so that would be like, okay, this is, that was me describing the neglect that I uh, experienced. I'm thinking of when it impacted me. I'm thinking middle school. I'm thinking of coming home and numbing out with porn. And I'm thinking of really bad fruit in my college years where I was actually like using porn, uh, meeting up with, with guys uh, that I'd meet online and stuff like that. So um, from that place, instead of having hatred towards myself, 
about the fact that all that happened, that I was numbing out with porn and I was doing these behaviors, I can think of, oh, I can have self-compassion towards that kid who needed help that still shows up. Like when I feel that part of me that feels stuck today, it's that same pain from fourth grade when I wasn't doing my homework, you know? And when I think of that part of me as a kid and it's good to just pause and ask, how do I feel him towards him? You know, if you were to look at a nine-year-old who was feeling so much shame because they're not getting their homework done and it's being announced in front of everybody or for everybody to see and he has to stay in for recess and he thinks, man, I don't know what's wrong with me. I feel so embarrassed, you know, how would you feel towards that kid? And you can actually allow yourself to feel that way towards yourself. And that's what self-compassion is. That's a lot of the work that we do with men and with ourselves of reparenting. That's exactly it. And when I consider too that, oh, I've been carrying now that wounding for years and years. How do I feel towards myself that, you know, am I going to beat myself up about it? Um, you know, before we I had something this week hit the same trigger of feeling stuck of like, oh, here's a to-do list to do. And at the beginning, before we pressed record, I said, Drew, I'm feeling tender. I'm feeling sensitive, you know? And so I'm not going to beat myself up. I'm going to allow myself to be seen, you know? So we can change our story of how we treat ourselves in our frailty. Can I just say, I love that about you. I wish I could give you a big hug right now. I receive oh. it virtually. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And you know what? Being known and not beating ourselves up and allowing ourselves to feel confident instead of feeling, you know, things like low self-esteem and self-contempt, like that is what our portion is as a child of God. Amen. What do you mean by that? Say more about that. Yeah, like, you know, we are heirs to the kingdom of God. So what does that mean? I I don't think I don't think God the Father is happy when he sees his children you know, as a nine-year-old feeling embarrassment, I think he wants to give him a big hug and love him and let him know how good he is, you know? And he would feel so much pain for him about what, he, knowing that he's not getting what he needed. Steven, you're inspiring me right now because asking how does God feel toward that little boy? How does Jesus feel toward that little boy can also unlock compassion and care and, and getting our needs met. And so at the end of each episode, you know, I always say, you are God's beloved son and you, he is well pleased. Right now, I feel like saying your nine-year-old self is God's beloved son. And in your nine-year-old self, he is well pleased. Yeah. And you can take that and change it for your six-year-old self or your 12-year-old self. Like, let's, let's, Claim that truth for every part of us. And then add on top of that, that that nine-year-old, remember we say pain, all pain is overcomable if it's processed, but if it didn't get processed, you've carried it for years. God still has compassion on you that you've been carrying this unprocessed wound for years and still is there with, you know, wanting to hold you, wanting you to know your love, that he's not beating you up about it. And we really got to change that narrative that God's beating me up about this, you know? Um, and I'll be real too, like being a father has helped me identify this and realizing that, oh gosh, the when I see my kid mess up and they feel embarrassment, what I feel towards them, um, I'm like, oh, I, that's a reflection of God's father heart towards me because I'm made in his image. So like, I say that because sometimes for me, I've had to consider how I feel towards my kids or how I feel towards a kid, if I imagined it, to get the wheels turning on like what God is like, like you can actually trust you are made in his image. And that like, if you are a man, you carry a masculine expression of the father's heart. And so all those feelings that you feel towards him are good and are natural and you can minister yourself. And it's good then to tie that like, oh, wait, this is what God is like. And it's probably much better than I could even provide too. I mean, it's, it's similar and magnified. So it's a really, it's really powerful to one, see yourself in that way that you carry that image of God. And then two, to realize, oh, this isn't just like psychological mumbo jumbo. Like this is me ministering God's heart to me. He wanted to minister his heart to me through a parent. And for whatever reason, that didn't happen in this area. Right. And he's grieved about that. He's grieved for me. I love that. He, 
he wanted to father us and mother us through our parents in ways that happened and we can be grateful for that and also in ways that didn't happen and we need to grieve that we can have gratitude and grief absolutely yeah and one of the most beautiful parts of how god relates to us especially in light of neglect is that he is always with us every single moment the one thing i want to say to you about compassion is there's another step to it which is i think it's powerful to actively be kind towards ourselves so I literally speak to myself. Um, I really believe in the power of spoken word over ourselves because the Bible says faith comes from hearing. I know it's talking about, you know, hearing the word of God, but I think there's still a principle in that faith comes from hearing. And, you know, there were words in my story that I needed to hear and I allow myself to hear them and experience the emotional goodness of hearing them. So the first thing I like to do is attune to myself, which would be, you know, validating. Like when I have this pain, I'll be like, it makes so much sense that you're feeling this. Like, and as I make sense of my story, like, ah, I'm so sorry that you didn't get help with homework and that you were so used to getting that things done and that you believe that you're just incapable of completing a task, you know, completing a task or seeing something through. I'm sorry for how you hated yourself in that way. And I attune with myself and I'll speak these words of life to myself and I'll, I'll literally speak away shame. I'll say, I'm not ashamed of me. You know, I'm going to, be, and I actually, I always prove it by following up and telling somewhere else, someone else, yes, I'm struggling completing this project because I'm triggering. <laughs> I tell my friends about it and allow myself to be seen and loved in my process. Um, and then I speak hope to myself and I just let myself know like, hey, I'm not going to abandon you or shame you as you continue to grow in this area. Um, you know, if you need investment, if you need more parenting, if you need help, like I will get you a coach to help you figure this out. I'm not going to leave you or abandon you. I'm going to walk with you every step of the way. Um, we're going to get there because you are awesome. Like that is my conversation with myself. And that's what I want to say to my kid. Like I have kids now and that's what I want to say to them. And, um, and that's, it, it's so powerful. Just let yourself bask in the goodness of the Lord. Uh, Philippians says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is pure, you know, think on such things. He wants us to experience abundance in our sexuality. where We're walking it healthily. Um, he wants us to thrive. and um it's not like i think the other thing i want to address is oh if we're too nice to ourselves will i become prideful you know um to me like i said being able to feel confidence is just so much better than all of the self-hate self-loathing the low self-esteem i carried that i just praise the lord for it i'm so grateful for him it increases my worship to him because it's like oh wow you i have needs and i'm acknowledging them and god wants to meet them it just expands my relationship with God and the closeness I have with him. Yeah, it's that abundance you were talking about, which is the opposite of scarcity. And in some ways, neglect leads to a scarcity mindset. There's not enough for me. There's not enough love. There's not enough time. There are not enough friends, not enough ways to get my needs met versus abundance and trusting that there is enough. Yes. But it takes a risk. It takes a redemptive risk to reverse that curse and to step out and reach out to somebody else and to be real about what we're feeling. It's a risk to go to a coach and say, hey, can you help me heal? Can you help me deal with the neglect that's underneath my attachment to porn? Amen. It's a risk and it takes um, it takes a humility that I truly respect and honor. Um, because I'll be real. I mean, I have clients that are significantly older than me. And the fact that they're allowing me to speak into their life in this way, I'm just like, dude, I want to be like you as I continue to get older, that I'm going to be that yeah. teachable and coachable. And if I just like, it's that thing, hey, I'm not going to beat you up that you have this problem. I'm going to walk with you until we get to where you want to be. Remember how I said, we're going to speak hope to ourselves. Like I look, I'll say that we decide if we realize we're doing this and we're not getting anywhere and you need external help. I'll take you there. I don't care if the person's 15 years old and is an expert. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's just, I, I, it's, it's actually loving ourselves in a, in a proper way. It's so validating to understand that whether or not we call something trauma or whether or not it fits a certain description or if it's more harmful than what somebody else experienced, we were shaped 
by these early experiences of presence and absence. We were shaped by these early experiences of shame and isolation. And no matter, no matter what your story is, like there is a part of it which still needs to be completed. There are places where we all get stuck and some of those places that are the stickiest where it's like, oh, I just can't get unstuck are the places where we were most neglected. Amen. And it's so hard to know like, oh, it's a blind spot because it's like, oh, I can say, I can I can express this. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's a lot of self-contempt because we feel things that we don't think we're allowed to feel. Mm-hmm. And I think too, if you think about it, anything that goes against God's design, um, I just think there's like sin actually has natural consequences to it. So, you know, the brokenness in our family systems impacts the next generation, you know? And um, yeah, my parents said some things that were great for me. I'm glad that they love the Lord and walk closely with him that because they weren't as strong in this area, God just gave them dreams. I'm really grateful for that, you know, uh, to, to show them, Hey, your son's struggling. You need to talk to him. But I think it would have been better. Like I, I want to heal in the ways that I need to heal so that, um, that it doesn't have to get to the point where I was acting out the ways I was, where my kids aren't there because I've healed and I've processed it. And I'm not allowing that generational curse to continue. Yeah, I see that happening in my life too. I think in some ways we all pass on what was given to us. And when I was a boy, I was given a Game Boy. I was given a a video game, a screen, uh, which of course I craved and I really, really wanted. And my parents gave it to me and they gave me a TV and they gave me a computer. And part of why... I'm able to do husband material online is because I'm very, very comfortable with screens. And that's part of the goodness and the strength that came from it. And it's hard for me to unplug. And sometimes I'll be with one of my children and I'm on my phone and I'm not proud of that. I'm not proud of the frequency at which I do that. And I remember one time I wasn't actually looking at a phone. I was just talking on the phone and and my daughter was was yelling and she was saying, dad, no, no. And I, I got off the phone and I said, Chloe, how does it make you feel? And she said, it makes me special. I was like, oh my gosh. All these times when she has not felt special um, are ways that I haven't parented her in a way that she needed. And now as I reparent myself, Um, I actually get to make her feel special and in her words, make her special. Amen. That's so good. Breaking the generational curses. That's right. That's exactly it. And I want, I hope that people who hear this and hear you and hear me talking about, oh, there's places of us that are still tender. There's parts of us that want to numb out. Screen time is a way of numbing out. I can do that too. And there's yeah, I agree with you. I don't feel proud of it. But like, I just want you to know, like, we're both on a journey of, we're going to keep going. And we're going to keep like, recognizing, hey, I'm numbing out here. I have more work to do. You know, healing, stewarding our hearts doesn't even just end at sobriety. That's one fruit of it. Um, You know, sobriety from porn. And there's other things to get sober from. Screen time, you know. (laughs) I'm totally with you. And I just want guys to hear that. Because, um, like, I talked earlier about downloading a new operating system. Um, that new operating system is going to be, like, constantly looking, you know, for things like this. Like, being honest with myself of, yeah, I'm in pain and I'm escaping it right now um, through this or that. You know, maybe it's not porn, but it, it, it's, being oper- it's being honest with myself and continuing forward. And all that does is invite me into more healing truthfully and it creates more blessing for the people I impact which is you know the people I see obviously are my wife and kids and we both have ministries but that's I don't I just think it's important to acknowledge that agreed oh this is so awesome I almost feel like maybe the the title of this episode could also be how was I neglected how was I neglected because we all had needs that were not met 
and together we are healing. So Stephen, what is your favorite thing about healing from neglect? That piece of not hating myself and allowing myself to be honest about what I'm feeling and to tell others, being known, um, it's, it's so much better. <laughs> it's just so much better than hiding. And to me, it, like I said, it's a fruit of the abundant life that Jesus paid for us to have. And when the world gets to see that fruit, I think they're going to want to know Jesus. That's such a beautiful thought. Stephen, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me, Drew. It's always good. Awesome. Stephen is leading Husband Material Groups. You can reach out to him. You can reach out to me if you want to be a part of it. And gentlemen, always remember, you are God's beloved son. In you, he is well pleased. Mm -hmm.